right. Are we ready? I'm ready. Hey, everybody. It's really nice to see you guys. Thanks for sticking around uh, to the tail end of the conference. Um, I'm Eric. This is Dave, David, and I'm really excited to kind of talk to you guys today about something that really piqued my interest. Um, we come from very different backgrounds, so uh, I kind of wanted to explain a little bit about why, why I'm here, why I have the opportunity to kind of talk to David. And um, a, a mutual friend and fellow artist introduced us a few months ago and said, you guys would probably get along, and you probably have some shared mutual interests. And uh, to be fair, I've been collecting comic books and comic cards since I was a kid, but really kind of missed out on the middle section of like pop culture uh, over the last couple decades. And so even though I was introduced by a really good friend, I was like, man, I, it, w it was uh, something I was very curious about, but I did not expect that I was going to leave so inspired. Um, so the call was initiated. First of all, it was a video call where David and I had uh, a very long conversation about ripping open uh, comic book cards and chasing the hologram, which is something that if anybody's collected baseball cards or comic cards, like that's, uh, it's like very aligned with what happens in the generative minting ecosystem, which is where I come from, and probably inspired uh, a lot of what you see at Art Blocks today. And then there was a studio visit. And in that studio visit, um, I, met a, I met a man that was building very quietly uh, from a place of curiosity, passion, and delight, something which is very important to me um, and, and, and kind of how I proceed in this space. So. I left that studio visit completely excited about this idea that, as someone that collected comic books when I was a kid, um, I was really excited to share this with my kids. I was really excited to be part of something from the very, very, very beginning, to get to like share the experience of discovering new people at the same time as my children were doing so. And I got really excited about it, and since we've had a lot of conversations, and it feels uh, like a, a, a great pleasure and honor for me to be here to interview David today. So first things first, what drove you to uh, found Marvel Studios? Yeah, first I want to say I really feel honored um, and if, with you doing this. Um, this is my first public talk since I sold Marvel to Disney over 10 years ago. Um, Disney came out of uh, a lot of things uh, that were in my mind in 2003. Uh, when I came up with the idea for Marvel to make its own movies um, and uh, what became the MCU. Um, it was really my passion for Marvel. It was one of my biggest things that I cared about in my life um, all the way to now. And my love of it and my desire to share that with the rest of the world. I remember going to Comic-Con in 2003 and it was sort of like this where it was people that loved what they were there for. And, um, but the whole world didn't get it yet. And I realized, my God, this should be shared and, and movies could be the way to do it. Um, and by the way, I feel the same way here at my first convention like this, that um, it's going to be fun for this energy to be all over the world um, with all of us working hard to spread the word and build. Um, so Marvel came out of passion and love for it, my desire to be creative, my desire to share that with people around the world. Um, and I joke, you know, with people, and a little bit of wanting to make some money, <laughs> um, to be honest, but it came out of this real desire um, to have an ability to share what I love. Um, and then from there, uh, you proceeded to stay in the world of comics and yes. proceeded to follow your passion um, and ended up with this really incredible organization that you put together called Ecos Genesis. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, I, I love the medium of comics. I also love escalating uh, the stories and the characters of comics and now the art of comics, which is what Ecos Genesis art collection is about. I think the best way to introduce it to you all is to show you um, the first piece of content we put out all of at, you know, at the, a week ago. Um, it's about 30 seconds and then I'll talk through it, but I hope you guys enjoy. Things 
things are changing for the better this time. Ooh, things are changing. Thank you. Um, I, I'm really uh, glad that you guys hopefully enjoyed that. Um, everything we do that I did at Marvel, that Marvel continues to do, um, and that Ecos aims to do, is to bring that the light that I hope you experienced in those 30 seconds. And if I talk through that video, I think you'll learn a little bit about Ecos and about me, things that Eric learned when we had the luxury of spending some time together. Um, the very beginning is I do love the medium of comics. So for Marvel Studios, we wanted to come up with a pre-movie logo treatment that showed people um, and stood for what Marvel Studios was going to become. And it's that flip through the comics from the old movies. Um, this is an homage to that. Um, and it flips through the art of Ecos. Um, and the art that is part of this Ecos Genesis art collection um, made famously by Michael Turner and Peter Steigerwald years ago and new art that we've created from that for this collection. Um, the middle part of it is a word slide and it has a couple key words on it that all mean a lot to us. Um, it says one of one, original handcrafted digital art. The one of one means what it says. Every piece in this collection, there's 995, is a one of one. There's no limited editions. These are one of one pieces of art, and we really wanted to make it pure that way. So you own something, the collector will own something that nobody else owns. Um, there's a special feeling when you have that. Not just the top condition of a comic, but the actual one of one of that comic piece of art or that piece of art, because I think the word comic will become irrelevant once you see and people experience this art. It's just where the genesis was of that particular piece. The word um, original means a lot to us. Um, I think in this whole collection, less than 5% have any physical manifestation. When I talk it through in a little bit, it's just some of Michael Turner's original pencils. A lot of them have been inked over by the inker before they're colored. Um, but the rest of it are only originally possible through this medium of Web3. Um, handcrafted is a key keyword. Um, and this is something I had a huge joy talking Eric through um, and others in the space that have been so welcoming to me um, and to my team as uh, we enter this. We've been hard at work at this for well over a year and a half to create, as Eric said, we've been very quiet about it to create what you're about to see. And um, I think the best way is to talk you through a piece of art um, and just actually show you what we did. So for every comic, if you're not aware of it, there's a pencilist, in this case Michael Turner, who would create the original pencils. Um, those pencils would originally get colored by the colorist, and then you see that published. Michael, in my opinion, is one of the best line drawers that comics has ever seen, that art really has ever seen, um, and at least of the last 20, 30 years. He tragically passed in 2008. Um, I always, I collected his art since right around that time, so it's been 15 years now. Um, and frankly, other people loved his art. James Cameron, the famous director, loved it so much that he optioned the rights to all of Michael's um, entertainment and other uses besides comics. So I never thought that this drop would be possible, but because he got busy with Avatar, the rights cleaned up and his friends, when Michael passed away, his best friends who run Aspen Comics, who knew me from collecting at Comic-Con, called me uh, and asked me to get involved. And after all this work, you're seeing the result of that. So here's a Michael line drawing. This is actually from a panel page. A cover page is very easy because there's one big picture. And we took one of my favorite covers two years ago, cover to Fathom One, one of his most famous comics, which was the top comic in 1998, uh, even above Marvel in DC, which was crazy for an independent studio, independent comic book company. Um, and we took that line drawing and published cover 
And that was a beautiful big picture. Um, and that went um, for $100,000 at the time. But there's also panel pages that have beautiful art. So I'm showing you one of the more complicated things. When I saw this panel page, I see that panel that's the third one down um, with uh, this lady with the wings. Um, in the comics, her name's Grace. And there's beauty in that. But a lot of people miss it because they're not, they don't, they see the other panels, or they see word balloons. And so we came up with our own rules. Some of us called it the human algorithm. We called it our just creative process, handcrafted, where Michael created these pencils before he passed, obviously. And we were not allowed to change the pencils. We're not allowed to add anything, but we're allowed to pluck out art that might not be seen because of noise around it that was there because of other reasons in terms of the medium. And by doing that, we get this. And all of a sudden, the world can see what I see when I collect a panel page. Um, this beautiful art by Michael and line drawings. And then the original colors that Peter Steigerwald, uh, his artistic partner, who is still around and is the artistic genius for a lot of the art you're going to see today, um, did these colors way back when, 20 years ago. And now taking that, we have the original published piece of art right there. So in the Ecos Genesis art collection, for every Michael line drawing that you saw, there's also a published piece of art. And then the question was, what deserves to be additional one-of-one -one art? And we spent a year and a half on this, like I said, and the test was very high. It had to be capital A art, and it had to have some meaning. And we came up with six other versions that are in the collection. And these are them briefly. This one's called Color Accent. And the rules for this was, you, it's Michael's original lines. And Peter, the original colorist, chooses accents of colors from the original published. So the only one you can see Michael's original lines and Peter's colors in a very clear way. This one is called Diamond Foil. And this was inspired by my love and a lot of collectors love, and Eric too, I think, of the silver foil uh, Marvel covers of the 90s, um, combined with a nod to Web3's Diamond Grails, and Peter's love of taking, he would take these, these type of guidelines and with complete freedom under those guidelines, create this amazing art as the colorist. Um, and this is his interpretation of that. Um, this one's called Back in Black, obviously a back background. Peter can choose whatever colors he wants. It was one he was personally interested in. When I heard that, it made a lot to me because Back in Black was the song I started Iron Man with by ACDC which was very intentional and set the tone to differentiate Marvel, Iron Man from the rest of the movies out there, um, set the tone for the entire movie. I really believe music has a powerful ability to do that. This one's called Gold and Bold, um, a gold background with bold accents, primarily black. Peter played with that rules, and it's just an homage to the eternal elegance of gold, and in this case, Web3's love of gold grails. There's a couple uh, people in Web3 that I, love, that I really admire where they were like, make sure the gold one is in. <laughs> and they really, really pushed for that one. Um, this one is called Electric Neon. Um, I've done a lot of Broadway. Uh, I did a show in 1999 called Fosse. I was fortunate enough to win the Tony Award for Best Musical. But I love the neon lights of Broadway. I grew up with it. I designed Fosse with neon lights as its visual DNA. Um, and when I told that to Peter, he always wanted to play with neon type of effects, and this is what came out of that, the electric neon version. This is called Black Light Pop, and this might age me, but I remember the 1970s, it does age me, um, uh, black light posters that Marvel put out. And I discovered them, I must say, in the 80s, not the 70s, but I, they made me think of comic art for the first time as art. Um, and I also really love the pop art movement of the 60s, Peter does too, we combine those two influences and this comes out in what we call black light pop. Um, I think those are the six that I went through here um, and there's actually a seventh which we call portraits which we've not revealed yet um, on purpose. Um, those are part of our uh, incentive for early depositors in our, in our auction but we're equally excited about what's called Ecos Genesis art portraits um, and 
the, in future introducing those to the world, they're also one of one original handcrafted digital art. And that's the Ecos Genesis Art Collection. That's awesome. Yeah. I Thank you for definitely system. loving all the colorful. Um, yeah, that was awesome. The, the colorful accents resonate with me, so I'm going for the for the rainbow ones for sure. Awesome. Um, and I spent a lot of time at this conference speaking at various stages about the value proposition of Web3, and everybody can add layers and layers and layers on top of what Web3 means, particularly in the world of NFTs, particularly in the world of proving ownership of a digital asset. Um, but all the things on top are kind of uh, extra. They're, they're nice to have. So what's really important here is the ability to prove ownership of a digital asset. And uh, something I've had the opportunity to say to different groups this, this week is that no matter what's going on in the markets, no matter what's going on out there, the sentiment, the blood in the streets, or like the crazy hype, that value proposition has not changed and it will not change. So if you've already heard me say that this week, I'm sorry, but that really is the basis of what I'm trying to communicate right now, that no matter what's going on, um, we're able for the first time in history to prove ownership of a digital asset. So I say to you, you know, like what, why Web3? I mean, that, I think we have a lot of alignment in what that is. The idea that you could have this pencil, mm -hmm. the original artwork, and then um, be able to create additional artwork on top of that but be able to be value as an one of one or as something that's original. Um, you know, what, what, uh, what else, is there anything else about no, I Web3 think Eric, there? That's, I think that's exactly right. And I think it's, it's worth to be emphasized here. This whole collection, this, this Ecos brand um, would not be possible without Web3. I believe strongly, um, when, I, when I did Marvel, in 2008 was the first product, the Iron Man movie, on May 2nd, 2008. And almost 15 years ago exactly. It was a very different time. I had no Marvel films to compete with. I had no streaming to compete with. And so oddly enough, making a $300 million movie and a global film was a great way to connect with people. It wasn't the best way for now. It isn't the best way for now. I think there's so much noise that we have in our lives, there's so many pulls on our time, so much distractions, that for something new to break through, there needs to be a visual identity to it and a primal feeling from it. And art does that for me, I think it does that for Eric, it does that for a lot of us. And so the ability to lead with art um, became a dream of mine, to connect with people in a simpler way. I like new challenges, but I also think it's the right way to connect with people in this world across languages, across countries, across generations. Um, people can see, hopefully, the art that you just saw and enjoy it and connect with it and feel some level of calmness and of delight and of att attachment to it, whether they collect it or not. Obviously, if you collect it and you own it, you feel more. And to Eric's point, this is only possible because of Web3. I wouldn't be able to, and we wouldn't be able to, um, have this art actually have the provenance of being of one-on-one -on -one piece, uh, of being authenticated, of being delivered in this way, shared, if it wasn't for what we all call Web3. Um, so it came together beautifully for the time. Um, and without it, um, there's, no, there's no way to do this. I'm, I'm excited, uh, obviously, about the space. Um, I treasure my new friends in the space. I'm, I feel like a, a kid again. I feel like I did when I was in 2006 telling people I'm gonna make the Iron Man movie. Um, and nobody believed in me and th thought I was crazy. A lot of my friends not in the space look at me the same way now. <laughs> um, but um, I'm used to that and, and used to trying to see something that perhaps others don't. Um, in, the, in the mainstream uh, and, and willing to carry that flag and sort of tilt at that windmill um, and try and make it happen. And so I, I really am thankful that Web3 is here and I'm able to experience it and use it in this way. Uh, you touched on how the art is made, yeah. but what was the inspiration behind it? Like what inspired this art and what, why this art in particular? 
it, it's really, it's so similar to, the, to what inspired me with Marvel. Before I got into the business structure of Marvel and the, the legal things of getting our rights back and the, the mountain to climb to, to form a new studio, because we made all those movies independently, it was, I just loved Marvel Comics. I had a connection to them. And I felt and I saw that that connection should be broader. I love Michael Turner's art. I, I don't collect any other art outside of Marvel, like no individual artist, uh, than Michael Turner. Um, and Joe Quesada is my favorite Marvel artist. And Michael Turner did one piece of art for Marvel called Civil War. He did a couple of pieces, but that was my favorite Marvel cover ever from 2006. And his line drawings, you know, the reason I collect them, and I don't frame most of them, I literally, as Eric saw when he visited, I like to hold them, right? They make me at three in the morning when I wake up. Like, they give me a sense of calm and beauty. And I love sharing them. And I can only share them with people that come visit me, you know? And, and people that see it love it too. And so it comes from that, like the ability to share that with everyone. And then the people who collect it, they can share it broader because of how we share digital art these days. You don't have to just go to the museum or go to somebody's home. And um, so the, the really the question why comes from the same seed that was in me for Marvel. I don't think I could do something if I didn't feel that passion to it. This is a little, a little bit um, of a different kind of direction of a question, but you know, is there anything that you've learned from the Marvel experience that informs the possibilities? or the challenges, because I think really important, as you know that I'm kind of a negative Nancy in a lot of our conversations, I'm like, you gotta double check things, triple check things, <laughs> like the, you know, the likeliness that it is true goes straight, like it's just like Web3 is just this kind of like, we're writing a, a, a script here and we're all figuring out as we go. Um, but you know, this, this informs a lot, the possibilities, the challenges of Web3 and the business models uh, for people that are producing culture, and you are producing culture here. So, is there anything from your Marvel experience that informs that, that, that you think you can bring to the table? Because in Web3, generally, we're feeling fatigued. In general, in Web3, we're feeling... Yes. Your experience at Marvel has to bring, you know, some, you know like, you, it's, it's such a crazy experience, you, what you shared with me, mm -hmm. you know, buying the studio and then turning it into what yeah. you did. So, I'm just curious. If no, you Eric, it, it's, I feel fortunate because when I did Marvel, I didn't have the founder of Marvel Studios on my resume. Um, this, this goal um, and what you see with Eco's Genesis, I'm able to do because of my past accomplishments, right? We're sitting here today because of that. And I feel so fortunate that I get to play in that sandbox. But I also feel what Eric's saying, um, you know, that I hope this shows a vote of confidence from somebody who doesn't need to be in the space, who, who could be doing many other things. I don't attach my name. I haven't gone out publicly as the founder of Marvel for 10 years. Um, it's not what drives me, um, as the people that know me know for sure. Um, and I really want to share this art um, and, and the possibilities around it and, I, and what we call ecos. Um, and I want to hopefully contribute to something I know it's near and dear to Eric and other people in the space, which is shining a light on the possibilities and what can be good about everything that is in Web3, about the key things in Web3, um, not just the light on, on the issues that the mainstream press might sh shine a light on. Uh, and the best way is not words, but through action. And me doing this uh, and people delighting it in it. Um, and I hope, I hope this causes people to look at things uh, with a beginner's mind again outside. Um, I'm certainly answering that question a lot when I go back to LA <laughs> uh, and to some of my investors. Um, but they love me personally and they, they love my art, they love my vision. They understand that my vision uh, with Marvel wasn't understood for five years. Um, frankly, Warner Brothers had the rights for Iron Man for many years and gave them back to me even after I announced the studio. That's how much people cared about Iron Man at the time. Um, so I'm used to people not necessarily seeing it. And I hope, Eric, that this helps uh, all of us um, show the possibilities of what this can become. Well, I'm excited about anything that demonstrates the opportunities that come from Web3. So I appreciate right. 
Appreciate that. So the, the last part is just what's next? What do you have What's the next <laughs> I, step? Um, stay tuned. Um, the, the only thing I can say right now is um, there's only a few days left here. Um, now that I have done my first appearance with Eric here on this stage and hopefully haven't messed it up too much, I'm supposed to do a Twitter Spaces on Monday at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time, Silly Tuna, who you might know, um, moderating. Um, and that will be one day before our May 2nd 10 a.m. auction. Um, and uh, that happens to be the 15th anniversary of the exact date that Ironman opened. So it all turned out perfectly, this conference and that date. And it's obviously a lucky day for me and, and uh, one I remember very fondly. And I'll, I'll be sharing some of that memories um, on Monday um, uh, with everybody. So I'm looking forward to that. It's awesome. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to get to like, share some of this with, with this, with this space, with this ecosystem, and uh, the opportunity to, to talk to you about it. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be great. I'm really excited about it. Thanks, Eric. I, I, am, uh, I, again, feel honored that you're interviewing me on this. I hope you guys all enjoyed this. Um, there's a lot more you can read about, and there's, there's us on Twitter and a website. I went to, whether you're a collector or not, enjoy it. There's a lot of love there. Ecos.io and at Ecos Genesis. Um, and however you're involved as a collector or just an observer, please enjoy the journey um, and uh, happy you're along for the ride. Thank you. Thank you.